Now, while they're headed out, I'm just going to let us know that today we start a new series. And the title of this series is In Search of One. In Search of One. So the beginning of the year in January, we started with an internally strong series, Do What God Made You to Do. We followed that with another internally strong series, Just Say No. Um, and then today we're starting with an externally focused series, right? So many of you know that our vision here at the church is to be internally strong and to be externally focused. And when you think about your life and what you're doing in life and why you're actually living, I'm hoping and we're hoping as a church leadership that when we give you phrases like being internally strong and being externally focused, it gives you vision for your life. It helps you to know, these are the things that I'm about. These are the things that I'm pursuing. This is the way that I ought to and should live my life. There's no better way to live. I'm looking for meaning and purpose in life. It's found by being internally strong. And when we talk about being internally strong, we say it's to know Jesus, right? It's to know Jesus and his word. It's to be transformed into his likeness. It's to do what he made us to do. It's to be connected in meaningful relationships. And if you can kind of grab hold of those phrases, those ideas, and have them incorporated into your life, we believe that's going to give you vision, meaning, purpose, satisfaction in life. Now, we also say we're to be externally focused. And when we talk about being externally focused, we talk about four different things. The first one is joining in God's mission. In other words, we understand that God is a missionary, that God is the one who sent. God sent his son. That's what missionaries are, right? They're sent ones, and God is a missionary. God has sent his son into the world. So we are to join in God's mission of being sent ones. Secondly, sharing the hope of the whole gospel. This means we're about meeting people's needs physically as well as their spiritual needs. Secondly, or third, helping those in need. We understand that God has called us as the church to meet people's tangible needs, especially those who find themselves in difficult situations in life. And then finally, partnering with others. We don't have to do it all. So this is an externally focused message series uh, in search of one. Now, to get it started, I brought along a few object lessons. The first one is um, this little sheep. All right, he's a cute little sheep, right? Um, I actually initially had thought about and asking a friend of mine if I could borrow a sheep. You know, bring this sheep in, right in through the auditorium, and I thought that'd be kind of interesting. It'd definitely get your attention. Um, and I probably would lose everybody's focus after that, right? And so instead, we have a picture, a picture of a sheep, right? So I just wanted you to kind of keep this in mind. So, so here's a sheep. But secondly, I brought along another item. It's um, this coin. It's a, it's a half dollar coin. Um, and, and I know you can't see it very well, so we're just going to give you a, a, an image of it on the side screen. But um, this coin is a, is a half dollar coin that I was looking through a collection of that I had this past week. And I noticed that uh, eBay is selling it for $3,699. Hopefully all of you are honest people and nobody's going to want to mug me in the next hour. Um, but so I brought along this valuable, valuable coin, right? And then lastly, um, it probably, no, no probables about it, but my most meaningful um, object lesson that I brought along is my granddaughter. And here she is. Sweet little Kendall. I had her all Friday. Now, my wife did most of the caring, or most of the work for this little girl. But, um, you know, one of the things that's uh, so awesome about her uh, that I noticed on Friday when she came was she has grown up so much in just one week. And one week, she went from just kind of like being this little thing to this little thing who knows that I'm there. I mean, she can see me. She is watching. Her eyes are moving and looking into my eyes. 
She, um, her voice box is definitely working. Some of you heard that a few minutes ago with her, you know, expressing her dissatisfaction. Right now she's doing amazing. I don't know if it's the lights. I don't know if it's you guys or what, but she's sitting here fantastically. And, um, you know, uh, it's really amazing to watch this little girl become who it is that God has made her to be. When I look into her eyes and she looks into my eyes, I just go, oh, that is so cool. When she coos and hums and awes and makes little noises, it's exciting. Why is it exciting? Why are these, all these things exciting? They're exciting because there's a little person here, right? There's a little person here, and it's awesome to see her expressing herself. All right, um, would you guys applaud for Kendall's first time on stage? <laughs> Way to go, sweetie. Go see mama. Thank you. So um, I forgot to uh, tell you that there was going to be a quiz, but uh, there's a quiz. I brought along three objects, right? Three little, um, uh, 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 well, I can't call my granddaughter an object. She's so much more than an object, which kind of illustrates where I'm go going with this. But I brought, brought along three things, right? And, and what's similar about the three things and what's different about the, the three things is my question. What, what's similar about the little sheep or the picture of a, of a real sheep um, of this coin and little Kendall? What's similar about each of these things? What's similar, class? I can hold them in my hand. Okay, very good. Yes, they can be held in my hand. What else is similar about them? They're mine, right? I brought them, right? They, they belong to me. Um, and then what else is similar? The, okay. The, and how about that they have... There we go. Oh, that was, that was fantastic. Everywhere. Value. They have value. They have a lot of value, right? Now, what's different, though, about them? What's different from the sheep to the coin to Kendall? What's different about them? Can't hear. Oh, okay, yes. Kendall is a person. So the sheep is a, an object or a thing or an animal. Um, and it's better probably to call the coin an object or a thing, right? But Kendall is a person. And being a person, she has an ability to express herself, right? That's what the first series was about in the beginning of the year. God made us, right? God made us in a unique way. She has an ability to express herself. In other words, she has what we call a will. She can pick and choose, and as she expresses her will, it's a really cool thing. And that's what she's doing with her little eyes as they're beginning to develop. She's expressing something about herself. She's looking and discovering and attempting to uncover. And as she cries, she's expressing discomfort, hurt, frustration, something. She's expressing, right? A will, the will is an amazing, amazing thing. And I love to watch Kendall's will develop. So right now, she's going to... Um, go from being able to just kind of look and coo in the next couple of months to being able to walk around the room. And we will all go, oh, wow, look at that. Look at what she, Kendall, is doing. And then, and then someday she's going to get old enough to say, Grandpa. And then she'll say, Grandpa, I love you. And I'll go, ah, oh, you know. And, and it's she loves me. That's an amazing thing. And then there'll be this day when she'll come walking over and she'll want to sit on my lap. And she won't be coerced to do it. She'll just want to do that. And again, my heart will melt, right? Because little Kendall is choosing. She has the will and she's choosing her grandpa, which is going to be awesome. Now there's something else about her little will. Her little will can also choose to do things that aren't so nice, right? And I'm sure there's going to be a moment when I'm going to go, oh, Kendall, you don't take your food and you don't throw it. Or, oh, do you see what she did with that pen and that marker? 
She wrote in a place she should not have written, and that does not make me happy, right? Or when she takes that toy from another kid, it's like, ah, Kendall, you don't do that. Right? So there's this thing about us as people where we have this will where we can choose. And sometimes the things that we choose are right things. They're good things. They're things that make us happy and make other people around us happy. But then there's things that we can choose and we do choose that are not right things, that are not good things, that don't make us happy. And the thing that is different about a sheep and a coin and my granddaughter and you and me is that those are objects and we get to choose. We can choose good and we can choose that which is not very good at all. Now you say, what does this have to do with being externally focused and this series in search of one? Well, to be honest, it has everything to do with the series and in search of one. Because as human beings, we have the ability to choose. You have the ability to choose. You can choose your God, your goddess, or no God. You can choose to do what you want to do when you wake up in the morning, to go to work or not go to work to pursue that relationship or to not pursue that relationship, to respond in a gracious way or to respond in a non-gracious way, to respond out of anger or to respond out of gentleness, to extend grace and forgiveness or to withhold grace and forgiveness. You see, we all have a will and we can choose to do things that bring us in alignment with the will of God, or with the will of our flesh and our own self. As we choose to pursue our own flesh and our own way, and not to choose God and choose God's way, we go our own way. And guess what? That's where all of us are when we're born. And that's where many people are today. Some of us here, most of us have found our way back to choosing God, but not all of us. This morning, we're going to look at Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to read through the whole passage. It's 31 verses. Some of it, most of it, will begin to sound familiar to you. As we read, I want you to listen for what do you find that is the same, but then what is different? What is the same and what is different? And what does the fact that you have a will have anything to do with what we read? Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Now there were tax collectors and sinners. Uh, notice how the NIV, which is uh, the version that you see in the side screens, has sinners in quotation marks. The NIV is very accurately translating Luke's intention in using the word, when he puts it in quotation marks, it's to say, this isn't what I think, this is what those that I'm about to speak about think. Now there were tax collectors and sinners who were gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. They whispered and they complained under their breath. This man, Jesus, welcomes sinners. See, it's not Luke who identifies them as sinners. It's the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious leaders of the day, the people who were following God, so they thought. This man, Jesus, welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus, understanding this and knowing that they're saying this, muttering under their breath, says, I have a story. So now he begins to speak to all those who are gathered at the table. All those who are gathered around him. And he tells them this parable. Notice, it's one parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep. Just like that picture that we saw earlier, right? Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave 
the 99 in the open country, probably with other shepherds, and then go after the lost sheep all by himself until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts that sheep on his shoulders and then goes home, calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one of these so-called sinners, religious leaders, who request or who, who repent than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. And after letting that settle in for a little bit, Jesus goes on and says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she's lost one. One of these valuable coins has fallen to the ground, fallen most likely in between the floorboards in her house. She's lost this coin. What does she do? Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over the sins, over the sinner who repents. And after letting that settle in a little bit, Jesus says, I've got another story for you. And so Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Now think about how bold and brash that is for you to request of your parents, your inheritance now while you are alive, and then take that and go off to a far and distant country to spend it frivolously on yourself. How do your parents feel in that situation? After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need, so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Oh, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So he went from having all of this stuff this wild living to having nothing. Now he's at the point of great hunger. And then Jesus says, interesting phrase, when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, when he came to realize his situation, when he came to realize what it was that he did, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. So I will, I will, um, yeah, I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, sinned against God, and sinned against you. So he's concocting this plan, right? He's thinking in his mind, this is what I'm going to do. Man, I'm starving. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to, I'm going to tell my dad that the way that I behaved is wrong. And then I'm going to tell him I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just please make me one of your servants. I mean, this guy's in a pretty low place, right? I mean, to, to say that he's willing to give up his status as a son to become a servant, like the other men that have served him as he grew up. But this is the decision he's coming to because he's at such a low place in life. He knows that going back home could provide him something. So he gets up. Jesus goes on and says, so he gets up and he went to his father. Now while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now that's quite the remarkable response from a father, isn't it? From a father who just gave, I don't know how he would do this, if he went to the bank and took out a loan to give what would be eventually his inheritance to his son, who then goes and squanders it all, 
has been gone for some time. Now he comes back, and the father, wow, what an act of immense forgiveness on the part of the father, right? To not withhold any anger or dissatisfaction or disappointment with the son. There's no indication of that here. We just see this father who, while he sees his son a long way off, runs to him, filled with compassion, throws his arm around him, kisses him. So the son says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to him, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. They had this big old party. Now, meanwhile, back at the house, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called out to one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? He said, well, your brother, your brother's come home. And your father has killed the fatted calf. Because he is back and he's safe and he's sound. So we're partying, we're grateful. Your brother has been found. Now the older brother became angry. And he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving. <laughs> what an interesting word, right? All these, la- all these years I've been slaving for you, Dad. I've been working hard for you, Dad. You've been like this master over me. I've been following all of your rules. I've been doing all of this to please you. I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. I've been always doing what is right. <laughs> Bit of arrogance there. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate just with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill a fatted calf for him? Legitimate argument. I think I might make the same kind. My son, the father said, You have always been with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. Now, I don't think my reading of this passage is anywhere near the comparison of what it must have been like to sit in the crowd like we are gathered today, and to hear Jesus tell these stories. Obviously a very pointed message. Lots of words, vivid pictures, so many angles to consider. Let's just begin with context. The context of the story is... Religious leaders, right? Religious leaders. Who are the religious leaders? Well, the religious leaders are the men who have studied God's word. They have lived their life studying the Old Testament, memorizing and knowing the covenant, living and following it, and leading others to know and to live and to follow it. Now, what do we know about the Old Covenant, and religious leaders, in particular the priests. We know that God has been pretty clear about how they are to approach him. As you study the Old Testament and you look at the way that the priests are to behave and function, their role is to represent the people to God, right? And to represent God back to the people and to stand, so to speak, as a mediator in between God and the people. And God being holy and just and righteous and pure and perfect gave instructions for how they were to approach him. They had all of these rituals, these cleansing rituals, these purification rituals. They had to put on certain kinds of clothing. They had to wash their hands before they went in. 
There were a number of things that they had to do. Why? God was the one that gave the instruction. Why? Because God is holy and just and pure. And to help them to understand that nothing unclean can be in his presence. So these religious leaders, they understand this. And so they attempt to live a life that is righteous and clean. Right? After all, you don't take dirty laundry and put it with clean laundry. Right? You don't take the dirty dishes and put it with clean dishes. You don't take dirty water and mix it with drinking water. And thus, they would in their right mind, conclude you don't take unrighteous people and have them sit at a table with righteous people. Seems to make great sense, doesn't it? These men understood something very significant about God, that he is holy, that he is righteous, and that anything that is unclean, he does not want in his presence. They thought they understood something about themselves, though. And this is what Jesus goes after. You see, they thought they themselves were holy and clean. And they thought Jesus would be holy and clean and thus not associate with, not sit with, not mix the dirty dishes with the clean dishes. And so to address this misunderstanding... And really, a heart issue, Jesus tells a story. Now, that's the context. Now, let's get into the story. The story is one parable. It's one parable with three stories to it. Now, I asked you to kind of pay attention as I was reading to listen for the things that are similar and the things that are different. What did you hear that is similar in all three stories? What did you hear? Something was lost. It was missed. It was loved because it was of great value. And then it was found, right? That which was lost was then found. And as a result of finding that which was lost, we have the next slide here, lays them all out. As a result of finding that which was lost, what did they do? They had a party, right? They celebrated. They rejoiced. Now, you know what that's like when you lose the key to the card. And and you've done this, right? You've done this. I know this has happened to me more than once. Keys have been lost, and you tear the house apart. Sometimes you go walking up and down the stream because your key fell in it. Yes, that happened to me once. And you spend hours, you're supposed to be fishing, and you spend hours looking for that which was lost. When you find that key, oh, is there not great celebration? Do you not call the rest of the family? It's been found, right? That which was lost, the coin, the sheep, but oh, the most significant part of the story, right, is the son The son is a person, right? And so that which is the same in between these objects and the person is they are of great value and they've been found. But what is different? What is different? There's there's two things that are different. The first thing, what what is different? First thing you notice that's different. Okay, different people lost something and and in the, in, the, in, the, in the first two stories, what were lost were objects, right? A sheep and a coin. The last story, what is lost, is a person, right? And, and um, what else is different is in the first two stories, and this is what I'm going to spend the rest of our time talking about. In the first two stories, what was the response of the owner? What did the owner do? Searched. The owner searched. The owner searched intently. The shepherd left the 99 and went after the one. The lady lit the lamp, got the broom, and went sweeping to find that lost coin. But in the last story, who was lost? The son. And what did the father do? He let him go. Now do you 
find that somewhat odd. I mean, if I lost this coin, I'd get looking for it. Okay, because there's a lot of value to this coin, right? I would be looking all over for it. I'd spend hours looking for it. If I lost the puppet, I'd have to buy a new one because really it belongs to Miss Becky, and she loaned it to me. But I wouldn't spend that much time. I would spend some time, but not that much time. But if Kendall was lost, if Kendall was lost, if she was seriously lost, man, I would call everybody. I would call friends. I'd call family. I'd call the police. I would go looking for her. We would send out an Amber Alert. I mean, we would, we would go nuts trying to find Kendall if she was lost. Now, if I would do that as a grandfather, I can only imagine what mom and dad would do. Why in this story does this father not do that? Do you not find that odd? How does a father not pursue his lost son? Hmm. There must be a reason why Jesus told the story that way. There must be a point that he wants us to ponder and think about and consider. He doesn't, Jesus, that master teacher, he doesn't un, unveil everything, does he? He doesn't unravel it all. Often we're left with these perplexing, challenging questions. Hmm. Which maybe gets even close to who it is that God is, that he leaves us with plenty of perplexing and complex questions. And many times doesn't give us those answers. Because perhaps he wants us to think, to wrestle, to consider, and to uncover, and to discover. Why would Jesus tell a story and not tell us why a father would not pursue his lost son when it seems like the most obvious response from the people in the story would be this father would be the one who would send out a search party. He would send his servants. My son's gone, right? When he sent out his servants, go get him. I mean, he hasn't come back in a couple of weeks. He, something bad must have happened to him. Go find him. Go to the next city. Look for him. Find him. Bring him back. And then if they did find him carousing and carrying on, they'd, boy, they'd bring him back by the ear, wouldn't they? Ah, we found him. And what would dad do? He'd go sit in the back room and sit on the edge of your bed for a while, right? And think about what you've been doing. Hmm. Maybe that's why Jesus tells the story the way that he does. Maybe because he understands something about being a father, right? So you as a father or a mother or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, you have a disobedient someone who has what? A will. This is why we get in trouble. This is why we disobey. It's because we have a will, right? And, and that's what makes a sheep and a coin and a person different is the sheep and the coin are just objects. They can't choose. They don't have a will, Kendall has a will, you have a will, I have a will. And with the will, we can choose to say, Dad, give me all your money, stick a dagger in your heart, I don't like you, take it, go spend it on myself, ha ha, stick it in my finger in your eye, spend it on myself frivolously. And the father will let him do it. Don't you do that as parents sometimes? Allow your kids to make the choices that they make even when it hurts and they make those choices because you know something, right? Instinctively, you know that you can't make your 23-year-old, who's now an adult, make a wise and righteous decision. And if he or she chooses to squander his life away by pursuing this and that thing that is destructive to him, what can you do? See, there's a sense in which this story, in which Jesus is getting at, is that even as parents understand that they can't make their kids do whatever they want them to do, even little Kendall, you know, there can be a time when she is little, she's a little terror, right? And she's disobedient, and maybe she's hanging out on at grandma and grandpa's house, and we're watching her, and I say, Kendall, what you just did is wrong. 
you know, and pick her up. She's, let's say she's four years old. You can, you can pick up four-year-olds, right? And you're going to sit right here, and you're going to stay there. And I can do that with a four-year-old, right? She still has a will, and, and there may be a day when she'll say, you're making me sit here, but in my heart, I'm not sitting here. I'm running and playing with my toys. And she could be totally right, and that's where her will is. Just like you and I have the same ability to say the same thing and to do the same thing as adults. And we do. I think what Jesus is getting at here is this. That we as people find ourselves in messes, okay? We find ourselves squandering things away. We find ourselves making bad choices. We find ourselves in bad places. And God who's the father, the picture in this story, God allows that. God allows that. God allows you to disobey him. God allows you to stick your finger in his eye. God allows you to make your choices. Why? Because you are made in his image, you are made in his likeness. And God is a God who wills. God is a God who chooses. Now when you think about relationship too, The other thing is, is I want little Kendall. I so desperately want my little granddaughter to come running up to me and give me a big hug and say, I love you, Grandpa. Right? I want that. That's what we want. But guess what? I don't want her to come up to me and say, I love you, Grandpa, because I told her, if you don't come up to me and be obedient and do X, Y, and Z, then you're going to have to come and tell me that you love me. I don't want to force her to love me. Right? What, we, that, that's not how it works. That's not how it works in our relationships with each other. And it's not how it works in relationship with God and how God works with us. You see, God allows us to choose what makes love beautiful and amazing is it's a choice. Somebody chooses you. They will you. And that's all God wants from us is for us to will him, to choose him to choose to place our will in alignment with his will. A couple of application points, and we'll wrap this up. Every one of us who's here today, listening online, middle of the week, five years from now or whatever, is lost or was lost. Every one of us. And how do we get lost? We have a will, we have a choice, and we went our own way. This is what the prophet says, the prophet Isaiah, when he writes in chapter 53, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So as it is written, Paul says this, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's not one who understands, no one who seeks God. We all have turned away, have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. We're all lost. Every one of us is lost or was lost. Now, the remarkable thing in the story is we see that Jesus tells the story in such a way that the son who was lost was found. And how was it that he was found? He willed something. What did he will? He willed to go back to the Father, right? And Jesus told it in a way, it was like an aha moment. It was like somehow he got to the bottom, the depths of his depravity, the depths of his brokenness, the depths of his lostness. He gets to that place, and then Jesus uses the phrase, he came to his senses. The light bulb went on. Something caused him to wake up and to see something different. The mystery. Oh, the mystery of the way that it is that God works and causes a light bulb to come on. But it happens. It's happened in many of our lives. We were lost, but when we got to a place where we came to our senses, oh, then we turned around. We repented is the word and went back to the Father. Oh, now we're choosing to go back to the Father because something became clear to us. We became clear. We were stuck in this moral bog and we need to go back to the Father and that's the place where we'll find true meaning and purpose and satisfaction in life. Paul picks up on this in Romans, next slide please, uh, in Romans 3 further. I'm gonna jump down to verse 20, well, 21. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law 
apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness from God, this is coming from God, right? The righteousness from God comes through, it comes through faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe, who believe in Jesus. There's no difference. For all have sinned, all people. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we can be found, right? Those who are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. You may be here this morning and you are lost. You are lost because you followed your own way. You're just like the rest of us. We've all followed our own way. We're, we're, just, we're, we're, we're choosing to do what it is that we choose to do. And without a guide, without somebody showing us and telling us this is the way to go, and that's who God is, he tells us this is the way to live life, we find ourselves in trouble. So this morning, you can repent. You, maybe you are having an aha moment, and this is a moment right now where you just say, Jesus, I get it. I have followed my will away from you. I've lived. And now he's saying, no. You're coming to your senses. Repent, turn, come back to me. For those of you who have had that experience, many of us in this room have had that experience. We know what that is. Then there's a second thing. There's a second thing. The second thing is this, that God who is on mission, God who has sent his son into the world to seek us and to draw us to himself, has sent us. And this is what it means for us to be externally focused, church. It means for us to go and find people who are living according to their will and living the wrong way, who found themselves stuck. And it's our job to go and to communicate that. And so here's the challenge with this external focus series. If you have been found, I invite you this week to think of one person who is lost. It may be somebody you work with. It may be somebody across the street. It may be a family member. It may be, it may be a, a neighbor. It could be anybody. Maybe you know them fairly well. Maybe you don't know them that well at all. Identify one person and think of what it would be like if all of us in here identify one person. All of us who are found identify just one person and let's just pray for them this week. Just pray for them. Pray that God would work in their heart. God would work in their life. God would reveal truth to them so that he would do his thing so that somehow, mysteriously, at some point, they would come to their senses. That is the work of God in a person's life for them to come to their senses. Let's pray for them. Secondly, I invite us to consider how we might develop relationship with them further. Invite them to go golfing. Invite them to go fishing. Invite them to your house for dinner. Invite them for a walk. Invite them to come help you fix something. Invite them to something. Further the relationship. Throughout the rest of this series, you're going to hear every single Sunday something about how we can be externally focused as a church. For the next eight to ten weeks, there's something you're going to hear and you're going to be invited to participate in. I'm going to list it out for you. Go to the, there, here it is. Um, here's a calendar of things that are coming. So this, today you heard about a Mexico trip. You, church, can be involved in that trip financially. Going to assist and help sending people who are there assisting and helping Rod and Mida Fry and planting churches. There's hundreds of people who know Jesus because we've been financially supporting the Fry's for the past 20 years. They're on to the third church plant. This is where this team of people is going. You can come to that fundraiser next week. You can go out to the lobby and flamingo somebody. You can do it's financial investment. You are going to hear from all of these different organizations. We're going to have conversations about some of them. You're going to hear interviews from different people on some of them. Some of those things up there, you have no idea what they mean or what. That's okay. We're going to get into it. I just want us to know, church, that we are invited to join God in his mission there are people who have willed their way away from Jesus. You have been found by him, and he's sending us to go find them. We are like the shepherd searching for the sheep. We are like the lady searching for the coin. God the Father is like the Father, patiently waiting while we are out looking and searching and inviting. Worship team, would you guys come on up? And as they're coming, would you guys pray with me? Jesus, thank you for this interesting parable and story that you've given to us. I ask that the truths of this would 
sink into our hearts and we'd learn and understand a little bit more about what it means to follow you, to relent to you. We pray for those around us who don't know you. And I ask, Jesus, that you do something in this series, that you would draw one or two or five or ten or even a hundred people to yourself as we live sent as you are sending us. It's in your name, Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Before we start the next song, I would like to tell you about it. It is a new song for us. It is called, I Speak Jesus. And th this song is about speaking the name of Jesus over everything in our lives because the name of Jesus has power. And so as we sing it, it's something you can pick up as we go. The um, verses are very similar. The chorus goes, your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Stand and join us. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus. 
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. people. You can speak them through your actions and you can speak them through your words. Let's see how many people Jesus draws to himself because we're being intentional with joining him in his mission, helping people get their will in line with his. Have a great week. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I gotta turn my mic off. Yeah.